Okay, hi everyone. Uh, we're about to start. Alicia Holmes will be uh, joining us soon. So before I give the floor to Tilly, just let me say for those joining us online that uh, they can choose the language on the bottom. Uh, they can select either Spanish or English. Uh, and, but very looking forward to this conversation and please, Tilly. <laughs> Buenos dias, uh, good afternoon, everybody. Uh, so I'm very, very pleased to welcome all of you to the conference Protecting Journalists at Risk, the cases of uh, Mexico and Central America. And definitely it's good to see so many people uh, here in this room. And we have even more people joining us online. I see already 25 are also there online, so it's very good uh, that this uh, topic has so much interest. So, as we all know, um, this is a topic that not only concerns journalists or, or media, uh, it concerns every one of us, because we know how important the role of journalists are. They pl play, indeed, a key role in providing information to all citizens so that, that they can participate in the political process and make informed choices. That is why press freedom is a cornerstone of any democratic country. But all over the world, also in the EU, journalists are under pressure. Every year, hundreds of journalists are intimidated, criminalized, imprisoned, or even killed only for doing their job. The countries we are talking about today in Mexico and the countries of Central America are all seeing different levels of pressure and attacks on journalists and media. In Mexico, the situation is extremely worrying. It is the most deadly country in the world to be a journalist, except maybe of some zones that, uh, where there is war. So according to the Committee to Protect, to protect Journalists, at least 13 journalists have been killed only in the first eight months of 2022. If this trend continues, 2022 is going to be the most deadly, one of the most deadly years on record for the press in Mexico. Every 14 hours, there is one attack against journalists of media. Many journalists also face attacks online. The violence against journalists is so high that entire regions of the country have become so-called silenced zones, where journalists are not able to do their critical or even their investigative reporting. There are also reports indicating that journalists in Mexico have been targeted by spy war. According to a report, by the investigative journalism NGO Forbidden Stories, at least 25 journalists investigating corruption and human rights violations have been subjects to surveillance with a Pegasus bio technology. Another way of preventing journalists to do their critical and investigative uh, work. In Central America, the region I know the most, the democratic space is shrinking sh more and more. Also, the pressure against journalists and media take different forms in the country. It is pertinent to say that almost the whole region is experiencing a decline in press freedom. In Guatemala, for instance, criminal law is used against journalists as a way of silencing them. José Ruben Zamora, the founder and publisher of the investigative daily newspaper El Periódico, and Flora Silva, financial director of the same news outlet, are both currently in pre-trial detention on charges for money laundering. Staff from El Periódico believe that this is in retaliation for their reporting on the president, Alejandro Guimatei, and on the attorney general, Consuelo Horas. In more extreme cases, legislation is support to protect women, such as the law against feminicide and other forms of violence against women, and is now used, imagine, is abused to try to gag the media. In various cases, public officials of their family members have been claiming that journalists have violated this law by publishing articles that cause them psychological violence, which have led to court issuing restraining 
uh, restraining orders against reporters. In El Salvador, press freedom is also on sharp decline. President Nayib Bukele is using the tactic more of Trump, namely portraying the media as uh, the enemy of the people. With a general anti-press discourse, many journalists face attacks on social media. The government has recently approved some reforms that can be considered also as censorship of journalist work. For example, earlier this year, the Congress approved a law in which journalists face 10 to 15 years in prison for reproducing or disseminating messages from gangs. In neighboring countries, Nicaragua, Honduras, as well as Cuba, the situation of press freedom is even worse. All these countries are among the countries in the world with the worst score of press freedom, according to, uh, to a ranking by reporters without borders. Journalists are constantly stigmatized and suffer from harassment campaigns, arbitrary arrest and death threats, forcing many of them to flee their country. I will not go into the details of the situation in each country, as I think it's much better that the, that the speakers here around the table from region can give their picture of the threats that journalists and media are facing. But I would like to say something about what can be done to support press, press freedom and journalists. First of all, although Europe is still the most secure continent for journalists in the world, there have also been attacks and intimidation against journalists and media freedom in some countries. We all remember the murder of Daphne Koran Caruana, a Galicia in Malta, who was killed because of her investigative work on corruption. Earlier this year, the European Commission announced a proposal to tackle malicious litigation against journalists and activists and a proposal for a European Media Freedom Act with new rules to protect media, freedom and pluralism in the EU. The European Parliament generally speaks out against attacks on journalists and media freedom all over the world. But I believe it's important not only to give international support to threatened journalists, but also to give international protection. The EU and the Member States should make it possible to issue emergency visas for journalists under threat. With Central America, the EU has an association agreement and there, the EU has to ensure a strict monitoring of human rights violations and strongly encourage our counterparts to ensure human rights and press freedom. It's also important that the EU delegations in the different countries in the regions do their utmost to set up protection for and measures for human rights defenders and journalists and to ensure observation and presence at hearings of criminalized defenders and journalists. To finish, the situation for journalists and media freedom is very difficult. I hope that the discussion today will help us to shed some light on these problems. And most of all, I hope that it will be a possibility to discuss what the EU can do better to support press freedom in Mexico and Central America and how to concretely protect journalists under threat. Thank you. Muchas gracias for listening. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Tilly. Cuando estábamos pensando... Thank you very much, Tilly. When we started discussing with the colleagues, we asked ourselves what was being a journalist in Mexico and Central America. And we realized that sometimes the easiest questions are the hardest to answer. It is a really hard question to answer, but it is even harder to be a journalist. My name is Daniel Jiménez. I am the incidents coordinator of the UNLAN ne network. We are over 40 European organizations working with Latin America to defend human rights. I would like to first of all thank Steely for hosting us here and sponsoring this event. I would also like to thank Henry Ball and I would like to thank ENO, the European Network for Political Foundation. It is great to work with other organizations and if we did not cooperate we would not be able to have such debate. 
it is great to have an M MEP with us and with the external service of the EU and this will allow us to think what is the role of the European Union and what can we do from Europe. Why have we chosen Mexico and Central America to talk about it? Mexico is a country and Central America is a region and the realities are different. However, from my network we have identified these two, three, these two regions as having similarities. Nicaragua has a different situation from Guatemala, El Salvador, etc. However, we can see the pattern repeating itself in all countries. We talk about closing spaces, but the space of the country is always closed and there are certain agents operating within this space. So today we will discuss about who is closing these spaces for journalists and the media and why. So we will answer the question, what does it mean to be a journalist in Mexico and Latin America? I would like to pass the floor to get an answer to the question, what do you think being a journalist is? I am going to introduce our colleagues today. So to my left, we have Camelia Muñoz. She was born in Monterrey, Mexico, and she started working as a journalist covering the local, the local context. And since 98, she's been working for different media as a, um, as a representative abroad. And right now she's working with Luna Radio and, and she's also part of the coordination, identifying people who have been disappearing. And she also works with another local network. She has received multiple awards, like an honor, honorific mention. And she is, after this award, she started receiving threats and attacks. To her left, we have Lucia Lagunes, who was born in Veracruz. She is responsible for the women information and for the AFEC news, news outlet. She has also received several awards, like the sixth award for press freedom in 2015 that was offered by the UNESCO and the Malaga University, and also another award from the from the federal district on the women's department. Then we also have Carlos Dada, who is the founder and director of El Faro, which is one of the main news outlets in Latin America. He was the winner of the Maria Musk Prize, and he was named the responsible for fresh freedom. We have Marcos Navarrete, he is an expert in Latin American studies and human rights. He studied in the US and El Salvador and now he works at Henry Ball Stifton, who is another one of our sponsors today. He's mainly worked with uh, political detentions and cultural diversity. We also have a representative of the social uh, of the civil society. We have H.O. Bandino and we have two MEPs, Tilly Metz, that has already presented herself and she's been showing her commitment to the region and to the defense of human rights. And we also have the colleague Holmes Ginel who will be joining us later. I am going to give the floor to Lucia and to Amelia so that she tell us how is the situation in Mexico. Thank you very much. Thank you very much for giving us this space to share our experience. Today we will be talking about five women journalists since December 2018 to August 2022 have been murdered. Marilena Ferral, Alicia Serraria, Lourdes Maldonado, Desenia Aurora and Sheila Joana. These are five out of the 15 women journalists that have been murdered in Mexico just because they were reporting to society, just because they were doing their jobs, just because they were 
investigate in human rights issues, corruption issues, because they were accompanying the victims and they were reporting on the data that need to be known by society. A couple minutes ago, MEP Tilly said that freedom of speech is the cornerstone cornerstone of democracy and if we are attacking and killing journalists there is no freedom if journalists are being prosecuted are being cornered then there is no freedom of speech and there's no democracy without it but if the victims are women this means that the threats and the prosecution is twofold on the lives of their journalists. They often have to leave their region and they even have to flee their country to protect their lives. During the last decade, the violence against women journalists have has multiplied fivefold. During the three years of the mandate of Enrique Peña Nieto, there were 248 attacks. During the first, the first three years of the current government, there were 770 and 67 attacks. Violence against women journalists is increasing. They keep saying that it is organized crime. However, 50% of the attackers are state workers, are public workers, are government workers. They are the ones attacking the journalists and the women. They also carry out smearing campaigns against women journalists. Without them, the attacks wouldn't be possible. They question the professionalism of women journalists because of their personal lives. They question the sexuality, they question their role as wives, as mothers, if they are feminine. So they question their role as a journalist because of the personal lives and this is also reflected online. They also suffer more attacks online. I cannot even repeat the insults that are directed against women journalists because otherwise I would be just validating the violence they are subjected to. The insults are all related to their gender and their race. Unfortunately, many of these smearing campaigns are coming directly from the policy of the president of Mexico. He uses his press conferences in the morning to point out the women journalists as the enemies of the government. Whenever these journalists question questionable actions, because it is their job to question them. They question the government and this is part of democracy. And it is the role of all journalists. What has been the result of the violence that journalists are being subjected to? What they wanted to do with this violence is to send out a message 
the women journalists were very important at the regional level. So if you attack them, you can tell the others as well that it could also happen to them. And as a result, everyone is being silenced. It is not just the journalists who are hesitating before publishing anything, but they are also rethinking how to publish something because the repercussions of any attack could be way worse than just reporting. There is a trickle-down effect on the actions of the president. The regional government also follow the lead of the federal government. As a result, governors also intimidate female journalists during the press conferences like the Puebla governor. He pointed out directly a journalist and he said that whenever a governor is speaking everyone needs to shut up and no one can question his words afterwards. This is just a proof of how violence against women journalists has increased. And this is also due to the fact that the attackers have total impunity. The general attorney has turned a blind eye on the reports of violence against female journalists. And as a response, the federal, the general attorney has investigated their personal lives. They do not look at their work, but rather their personal life. They say that the attacks are coming from a previous lover or something like that, and they say that the reasons of the murders are all of personal nature. They do not look at their job and the issues they are investigating. Impunity is one of the main issues in Mexico because 98% of crimes against freedom of speech go unpunished. The reporters on freedom of speech show that if there is impunity there will be repetition. Do we do not need to point only the material perpetrators but also the intellectual perpetrators of the attacks. We need to keep insisting on the fact that the only way to protect female journalists we need to have a gender point of view during the investigation. We need to acknowledge the role of female journalists and it is key in order to generate awareness within society and this acknowledgement of our role. We are the ones who have put human rights in the center of the political agenda. Fortalecer el mecanismo de protección que Strengthen the protecting mechanism in existence in our country for 10 years now implies ensuring not only financial resources that will be enough for protection of journalists, but also the profiles of the people who work within this protection mechanism. They need to be attached to human rights and they need to have a human rights perspective Today, the protection mechanism, which is the only policy in existence in our country, is very weakened. Not only by the staff working there, which is already a challenge in itself, but also because they do not have the necessary resources or the political power to actually build a protection policy that will actually ensure safety for women journalists. I would like now to give the floor to Camelia Munoz so that she can also be involved. Thank you very much for listening to me. 
Hello. Good afternoon. I coming I'm coming from the state of Coahuila. I have been there for the past 20 years. And unfortunately, when we started to cover violence and corruption issues in 2010, you know that this area where I'm coming from, the northern area, has seen the increase of the Setas, the organized crime organization who dominated a very large amount of things. And at the same time, in places such, such as Taulipas, Nuevo León and others, we have also witnessed corruption actions from the governments. We have covered that and we started to see how a series of uh, discreditation campaigns were unleashed so that we could not uh, inform about these issues at national level. Unfortunately for the governments, at that time I started working for the national media and I covered the killings, the massacres in La Laguna and in Torreón where we would see armed individuals who practically killed young people in uh, places that were uh, for rehabilitation uh, of drug users, they kidnapped people such as in Allende North and in others. We started to get involved in these issues. I never really imagined I would live what I actually lived. I could no longer walk or travel from Coahuila to Monterrey where all my family is still living. I stopped driving my car. I had to take a bus. It was horrible. And then there were discreditation campaigns where we started to give voice to the families of these that disappeared. And we have seen more than 100,000 this year. There was another uh, discreditation campaign because the governor at the time Today he is the coordinator of the PRI political party, Ruben Moreira. He called a few of us, it was three or four of us covering this issue, and he said that we were defending narcos because he criminalized the victims of the disappeared. And obviously labeling us and telling us that we were receiving money from criminal groups to so that we would discredit the police officers who were signaled in this area which is bordering with, uh, with Texas. Well, this placed us in a terrible situation. We, these were probably the worst months and years that I have experienced. It was horrible really, horrendous. It was a situation where we even thought of leaving journalism, dropping out, because I had to use my time for research and conducting interviews. This was actually meant wasting time before the public ministry agencies. None of my complaints has been brought to court. None of, us, none of them has been uh, seeing that a, another page was added. I have filed five reports, four have prescribed, and one of them since uh, 20, 2018 hasn't been closed, and this is because the UN is investigating some impunity cases in uh, crimes against journalists, and that's why it is safe. But since 2018, it hasn't progressed, and they haven't added a single page to it. In the Human Rights Committee, we have three complaints, and none of them has really uh, gotten to its end. In the provinces such as Coahuila, Guerrero, Sonora, the state of Mexico, even though some uh, organizations should be autonomous, such as the public ministry, such as the Human Rights Committee, the committees to help victims, they actually are not. And so in this kind of entities, we see organizations that should be protecting not only journalists, but actually all of the victims. And it turns out that they are 
part of the government. They do not investigate, they do not issue an opinion so that it cannot impact the government, even though we, the victims, continue to be intimidated, we continue to be persecuted, there is this idea that we should not address these corruption issues and these violence issues. This year, we created a group, we have conducted an investigation in seven states. Let me mention them, Jalisco, Puebla, Guanajuato, Veracruz, Chihuahua, Baja California, and of course Coahuila, so that we can determine what is it that states do. Since 2017, it has been determined that 32 states had their uh, committees to uh, investigate crimes against journalists. These committees should be the link with the federal mechanisms to, to protect journalists. And what we have found in this investigation is that these are paper committees. They exist on paper, but they have no budget. They do not operate you cannot really see who is managing them because in some entities they depend on the public prosecution, in others on the government secretary. In the case of Coahuila, they were under the Secretary of Public Security. For us women journalists who have filed complaints, this implied that they would say would send uh, undercover police officers and I can tell you a terrible anecdote. At that time the corporation was called Fuerza Coahuila and there was a call for help at the place. They came to my place and they started kicking my door. They parked in the middle of the road, they got off the car and they started kicking my home door. Imagine how scared I was and how scared my neighbors were. So I went out and one of them from the patrol started filming me with his cell phone. The other one took pictures of me. They were telling me there was a call for help and they wanted to know what happened. I just didn't know what to answer. I was really frightened. I told them to leave. I didn't know whether they were going to harm me or not, if they were going to hurt me or not. But this is how they, these institutions operate. They are the ones who should help the journalists. So this investigation was one, one of the things we found on these investigations is that they do not uh, continue in the investigation when there are reports they are there in sort of a simulation that we, they can or should do something, but there is no political will. You don't see in specific terms what should be done. I actually think that both the federal mechanism as well as these committees where the state should be operating Well, they actually have nothing, but one of the main things that we uh, journalists have required is to have psycho-emotional, uh, some kind of psycho-emotional support. From the year 2012 to 2018, we have experienced horrible days. There are many, many other cases, such as mine, at least in Coahuila. Three of our colleagues are undergoing a very difficult situation. They, I mean, we want to be able to work freely. With it. We, I don't want to have a panic button. I didn't even bring it. I haven't brought it to this trip because it makes no good for me. I have reported situations and the company uh, that is uh, su supposed to provide the service for the panic button while well, it takes hours for them to answer and they say I'm going to place the geolocator to see where you are and so they what they see is an area where that where I have been two hours ago so this is it makes this is just no good there are no preventive measures there is no policy 
to provide some kind of service to public officers. Because even though it is true that this part of Mexico, the Northeast region, at some point had the presence of drug trafficking, right now what we see is public officials. All of the aggressions come from public officials. We no longer see threats, kidnappings, homicides by organized crime. A few years ago they killed a journalist and actually this was the state police. Thank you very much, Lucia and Camilla. Let me provide you with some context. You just said that impunity is a green door to repetition. Well, they don't like us to ask for explanations. I think these two phrases allow us to understand a little more the reality where you try to exercise your profession as a journalist. And Carlos, I want to give you the floor. Our colleagues have talked about the role of the states. It seems these are states that do not protect, but actually they are the ones who are the aggressor. When we look at the Central American scenery, we all know, of course, that there is a dictatorship in Nicaragua, but Central America is very big. And I would like you to tell us a bit more about these patterns. Is there really a risk for the rest of Central America to see what we are seeing now in Nicaragua? Thank you, Danielle. Thank you, MEPs, for this invitation and this space to discuss what is happening in our region. I think MEP Metz has been very clear about the deterioration, the erosion of the situation in Central America. Probably in terms of freedom of the press, the easiest is to see how our countries have gone down in the index of freedom of the press. El Salvador has gone down more than 60 positions, Guatemala is in 124 and El Salvador is in the 102nd. So this is a very fast regression we have seen in the past three or four years. In the case of Guatemala, the breakthrough is very clear. It happens when political and economical elites have felt threatened, especially by the work of the International Committee Against uh, Organized Crime. And this is when they started to revert all our achievements in terms of institutionality, transparency, and all of those things that uh, elites have not liked in Guatemala. And this ended up in what the MEP mentioned, which is the imprisonment a few weeks ago of our colleague, Jose Ruben Zamora. I was going to be more concrete about the press in our country, but I think it is necessary to provide you with some context briefly. The Central American countries have experienced years of military dictatorships, civil wars, revolutions during the first decade of the 1990s, the first half of the 1990s. And this has shown the beginning of our democratic life. What I want to say is we are coming from very young democracies where we have seen forces that have clashed between them to be able to give the institutions some kind of strength to actually turn democracy into a reality and not just a simple promise. The current Central American journalism is radically different from the one we had before democracy. It is precisely a product of it. Central American journalism is a product of democracy. It is the son of democracy and in this sense it is the son of peace, 
of post-war, of the end of our military dictatorship. We created this lighthouse 24 years ago, and each time I mentioned it, I said El Faro wouldn't have been born had, it, had we not had the peace agreement. It couldn't have existed in a country where the military had a role in our political life. That was not possible. And this has allowed us to be able to be 25 years now. Central American journalism today is undergoing a limit situation in this uh, democracy, democratic period. We have never experienced this in our democracy. Of course, it is not surprising that it goes hand in hand with the process of eroding democracy, the process of consolidations of authoritarian regimes. With the end of the division of powers, the end of uh, judicial independence, with a political role that is now given again to the armed forces to defend the agendas of political elites that are walking towards authoritarian regimes and dictatorships. What do we have that discomforts them, that they don't like? We have a very powerful lie, uh, tool, which is this, it's the word. The word is a, a unique tool and this very simple thing, our word, is what is so uncomfortable now for autocratic Central American regimes. Democracy implies many things, not just electing political leaderships that will exercise the administration of the state on behalf of the citizens. It also implies a check and balances system, but it also implies coexistence, a plurality of voices and ideas. That's why I believe this is particularly important because we are discussing this in a parliament. Precisely in a parliament you exchange ideas, you exchange voices, you exchange point of views, you exchange political agendas, the interests of the citizens. When all of this starts to be reverted, what we see is silence. Silence imposed by a power that wants to be a single voice allowed in this political sphere. This is what's happening now in Central America. There are groups in power which do not allow or who intend to remove any alternative view of reality that is not the one shown by their propagandists. Camellia was saying, I thought of leaving journalism. This is what's happening. A lot of people are thinking of dropping out from journalism and who can blame them? Today, in one of the meetings, we said that El Faro is an organization of 30 people. 22 of them have suffered violence. We all know that each time there is Pegasus in our phones, there are at least two responsible states, their, their states and Israel. It's all the time at least two states. When we started to see some pressure in the families, they were saying the spouse of the reporter, this or that, you're endangering with, uh, you're endangering us with your work. You are exposing for free. You will get nowhere. The situation was much more manageable. When we made Pegasus public, we started to have different kinds of claims. It, it was, you can do whatever you want with your life, but not with mine. They have my children's photographs, and this is not going to go away. The pressures are increasing. There, there's people that are being persecuted, followed, they send pictures to their phones. 
the Inter-American Community of Human Rights has provided us with injunctions a few years ago, considering that because of the amount of threats against us, the state was obliged to ensure our safety and our life. And the Salvadorian state has offered us police uh, custody and we were telling them this is uh, this is not feasible for us because we are trying to get protection from them precisely and so they said what do you want well we want you to investigate who has been in, uh, chasing us with Pegasus with the spyware who is threatening us with the bomb out of office who has sent people to our homes we want you to investigate who has been inside the house the house of Julian Navarreta we are still waiting for them to investigate all of that. We mentioned this last night. We need to spend a lot of time telling your own history instead of selling the stories of the corrupt, of the criminals, of the assassins, instead of investigating the agreements between the governments and the gangs you invest a large amount of time and resources to defend yourself. Lucia was saying we need to see how we report, how we investigate, how we state things. Today we also need to invest resources based on our age. We have we've had four audits and they say that we deliberately evade taxes the president has accused us of money laundering. There are many uh, investigations opened against us. And I am very privileged. I had the privilege of obtaining resources for a legal defense. Central America is plagued by colleagues who cannot afford to have this luxury. Central America is now plagued with colleagues who are invisible. Journalists in the Guatemalan provinces who have written a report against a mining company and now they are facing a lawsuit. The use of the judicial system to persecute the press because the press is a public enemy with a very powerful tool, the word. I am not going to go any further. I just want to wrap up by saying Being a journalist is increasingly difficult. Nobody is forced to continue to do this. And the price to pay for this is not a price that anyone has, uh, anyone, no one has decided to pay this price in times of peace or war. Nobody wants to be a hero as a journalist. We just want to tell stories. This is what we do. We just want to use our word to tell those stories, to portrait this historical period, and th we are doing this. Those of us who have decided to continue for the time being doing journalism, we have also decided that silence is non-negotiable. It is not an option. We are not going to compromise our security in exchange for silence, because this is, implies being an accomplice. We will not compromise. Silence is not an option. Now we need to find a way to speak with a unified voice between the uh, Central American journalists and we are starting to work for this. There is another discussion. We don't really have time in this session, but this should be present and it should be present in this parliament and I think it is, and in Europe in general. And this is democracy. What is democracy for? Why, in my country, a man who has reached the presidency three years ago, the institutions have not resisted even for five minutes. Why this man, who has eliminated all the constitutional rights, we are in the seventh month of a regime of exceptions where they have imprisoned more than 60 Salvadorians with no right of defense, with no accusation, with no legal order, court order in the middle. Why this person who has given a coup to the judicial power and has assumed all the power, 
Why is this man the most popular president in Latin America? This man, who is fully anti-democratic and anti-historic, all the history coming before him is good for nothing, all was a deceit for the Salvadorans. Why is this man so popular? Why Salvadorans today do not like democracy that much and why is this the trend now? This discussion for us is urgent for the Europeans as well. But for us, not only the Central Americans, especially journalists and advocates in Central America, this is vital for all of us. We need a democracy to be able to exercise our profession freely. And this is the end. Muchísimas gracias, Carlos. El Thank you so much, Carlos. The civil, the civic spaces are being closed by people who have ulterior motives. Many journalists have to spend their time defending themselves. They play a key role in democracy, and we see how they are being silenced in Central America. As you said, El Faro would not have been possible during the dictatorship era, but do you think El Faro would still be standing in a couple of years with the current situation in El Salvador? Marco, I'm going to give you the floor to deepen our discussion a bit more. The space is not being closed on its own, people are closing it on purpose. Thank you very much, Daniel, and thank you very much to all of the people who have made this event possible. We are here on behalf of those who cannot speak up anymore. The situation in Central America is particularly complicated. It cannot be understood outside of the historical context of the region. In Central America, the state has been at its worst and has had the most power when they have attacked the most vulnerable parts of the population. Several governments all throughout the world have been co-opting the processes in El Salvador and Guatemala. Those processes have had the support of a large part of society. They have dismantled the institutionality of the peace agreement of the 90s. They are victimizing the majority and impoverishing the minorities. As a result, there is a society only interested in individual benefit regardless of the others just to survive. In Nicaragua and El Salvador, they have been fighting the social rules that allow for transparency. Right now, governments are not transparent. It is the only way they have to hide their debt, their illicit business and the anti-democratic actions as well as their corruption. That is why critical journalism that points out corruption actions is seen as a threat from authoritarian governments. In Guatemala, there are several journalists already imprisoned. In Nicaragua, they have dismantled all critical journalists. Same thing as El Salvador, where journalists are having to flee the country. There is a very tense relation with journalists, especially they are attacking journalists who are speaking 
up against the government and even Costa Rica is starting a policy against those journalists that are not favorable to the government. You can see that it is the same pattern all throughout the region with different expressions. However, they are masking an increasing authoritarianism by the government and they are going against independent journalists. This government has no solutions at the short and long term. That is why they are using this strategy. They have also co-opted the legal institutions in Nicaragua. In 2009, the Ortega Murillo family was re-elected. Same thing happened in 2021 in El Salvador, where violating due process they carried out a new election for the judicial power that was favorable to the government as a result there is no power division and this shows that the government need to stay in power to keep being absolutely immune to judicial prosecution The government in El Salvador is trying to do the same. They need to tackle all criticism. In El Salvador, there is still several governments, unlike in Guatemala. However, those politicians, especially and in Nicaragua and El Salvador, those political groups are in the hands of the elites and they would use all kinds of pressure to fight all of those fighting the grip to power and against and they try to impose democratic institutions they refuse as a result there is violence and crime in el salvador the current government is militarizing the country they will break the balance of the regional law enforcement forces there will soon be a structure that allows for paramilitary groups within the state of the, the state of law this appears to be a democratic institution but it is in reality a dictatorship el salvador is seeing how the government is manipulating and they are also using violence not just from the government but all of the mm -hmm. supporting groups the institutions in Latin America are quite fragile. In El Salvador, the debt has been rampant, and right now they will be unable to pay their debts internationally. The government of Honduras seemed worried because of their debt at the beginning of the mandate, and they have declared bankruptcy. The Guatemalan government is still contracting more and more debt and they use this money to repress the groups that are against the government. As a result of this situation, El Salvador is the perfect space for money laundry and all of those actions that go against the environment. They have they have stolen from the public treasury to maintain armed groups and groups that are favorable to the government and protect their interests the situation of the majority of the population is still quite precarious the improvements are not real migrants populations are 
a clear indicator of the situation in their region where there is violence, poverty, lack of opportunity, oppressing policies and clearly policies against the environment. They have needed to create an internal enemy. The feminists, journalists, social movements, social rights, right, human rights movements have been targeted by the state. They only become a problem when they can influence the public opinion. In Nicaragua, the government of the Ortega family completely abolished public criticism when they see that if there were free elections, they would lose their territory. In countries like El Salvador, they are the governments are clearly against democracy. They motivate the exodus of the population and all of these they handle it with armed forces, armed groups and a public ministry that has been co-opted. The state is also infiltrated by predator groups that constantly attack human life and human rights. The civil society is the main victim. State systems have co-opted all areas of life and this has been also made possible because of historical impunity. There is more and more poverty. There are more and more groups looking for impunity. They will now take the opportunity for this kind of dubious businesses to get richer on the back of the civil society. This kind of government allows for a lack of justice because the people who are being attacked are those that are also part of the most vulnerable st uh, part of society. The groups looking for transparency are the first ones that are being attacked by this kind of government. They will, they will keep pushing people out of the countries. It is quite complicated to fight these kind of governments because any time that there is any critics against such governments, they will be repressed formally and informally. Violence is considered the only way of controlling pluralism in journalism and in opinions. It is a critical point for Central America. We need to first protect vulnerable groups like women, LGBTQI, rural populations, indigenous people. Secondly, we need to guarantee the defense of the last democratic expressions like citizen participation outside of central governments. We need to guarantee that there are free candidates represented in all elections and those institutions who guarantee the defense of human rights. Also, we need to protect the victims of those defending the freedoms in a climate where the liberties are being reduced. We need to protect those who are risking their lives to guarantee a democracy and a just life for all. It is fundamental that we end the impunity of those excess in violence in order to guarantee civic participation in the democratic process. Those groups fighting for justice need to be protected at all costs through all means. It is 
a challenge, but it is also our responsibility. We need to protect life in all forms. Thank you very much. Muchísimas gracias, Marco. Uh, ahora le toca, el, hemos tenido el turno de la sociedad civil, ahora por parte del Servicio Exterior va a participar... Now the external service will be intervening. He is the head of division for Mexico, Central America and the Caribbean. I think your role is quite complicated now that we have heard the testimony of the colleagues. How, how can we defend the journalists in Central America and Mexico? Thank you very much for the invitation. With some uh, interlocutor that we visited, that we, we met. Uh, unfortunately, I've been a month and a half in this post, and uh, this has been a recurrent topic every week. So it doesn't come as a surprise uh, this deterioration of uh, uh, and this constant uh, um, uh, testimonies, witnesses on, on the region. Um, as you know, the EU is actively, actively committed to protecting the safety as independence of, and independence of journalists as an integral part of a proper democratic society. In September 2021, on the occasion of the State of the Union uh, address, President von der Leyen uh, said, information is a public good. We must protect those who create transparency. It is the journalists. In this context, the European Union already in September of the same month approved the recommendation on ensuring the protection, safety and empowerment of journalists and other media professionals in the European Union. That entails actions for member states to improve the safety of journalists offline and online. This recommendation follows a number of other recent initiatives, such as the European Democracy Action Plan, adopted in 2020, uh, strengthening, aimed at strengthening media freedom and media pluralism to protect free speech and the democratic debate. And the already mentioned uh, anti-SLAP initiative, uh, SLAP being the strategic lawsuit against public participation, launched by the Commission in April 2022 and aimed at improving the protection of journalists pro from abusive uh, court proceedings. I mention all these um, initiatives because even if, the, even if they focus on the EU territory, their content um, may and will have an important impact outside the EU and constitute an important chapter of our dialogue and cooperation with partner countries. The safety of journalists is at the center of EU advocacy uh, for media freedom in international fora and cooperation with main stakeholders such as the Council of Europe, OSCE and UNESCO and with civil society organizations worldwide. For instance, at the G7 this and last year and at the Summit for Democracy, we insisted on the necessity of a better coordination among the different international initiatives operating for the safety of journalists and support to independent media, including the Media Freedom Coalition, the Partnership of Information and Democracy, and the Online Freedom Coalition, and many others. The EU Special Representative for Human Rights, Imon Gilmour, is also paying particular attention to these topics that are structural part of his exchanges with officials and civil society interlocutors around the world. A couple of examples relevant for, for, for this meeting, uh, this year, he met with the Human Rights Ombudsman in Guatemala in May and with the Minister of Foreign Affairs of Honduras on the margin of the ONGA in September, and these topics were, of course, uh, raised. The EU delegations in the field um, are at the front line of promoting freedom of expression and the safety of journalists through their work with authorities, institutions and citizens in their countries. Uh, public diplomacy is an essential part of this effort. And a couple of examples are the Journalist Prize uh, awarded by the EU delegation in Salvador during the Human Rights Week in May uh, on the subject of human rights and democracy. We support the Media for Democracy program uh, through which we produce a hand handbook on protecting the safety of journalists, which was distributed to EU delegation already since 2020. And through the same program, we also funded uh, specific activities in Honduras and, and Nicaragua. Now, to mention specifically uh, some uh, work in other countries, um, we remain concerned about the continuing high levels of attacks against uh, 
and assassinations of human rights defenders and journalists in, in Mexico. And in our inter interactions with the government, we continue to call upon uh, the relevant authorities to spare no efforts in investigating and bringing to justice the material and intellectual perpetrators of these crimes and those against all human rights defenders. Uh, this was, for example, done more recently on the occasion of the EU-Mexico Human Rights Dialogue on the 4th of July here in Brussels. Um, we acknowledge and supported the very important work of the Mexico Federal Mechanism for the Protection of Journalists and Human Rights Defenders uh, and been um, strong supporters since its inception in 2012. Ensuring the sustainability of this mechanism and improving its efficiency are key, and we remain willing to explore further ways of um, strengthening cooperation with the Mexican authorities uh, towards that end. And nonetheless, we understand that legal reform is underway, whereby a mechanism, the mechanism will integrate regional components for every state. And NGOs have been, representing, have been presenting this issue as a matter of concern. Uh, including at the EU Mexico Civil Society seminar that took place on the 1st of July in Brussels that preceded the last uh, EU Mexico Human Rights Dialogue. As uh, they felt that the federal element of the mechanism is what ensures its greater independence and impartiality. Um, in El Salvador, uh, we, of course, we recognize the severe problem of, uh, of gang violence, but at the same time, uh, we have consistently and directly conveyed to the authorities that any measures introduced with a view to restoring security should be proportionate and comply, uh, comply with international obligations. Security measures should not be used in an arbitrary way, nor put at risk fundamental rights such as freedom of the press and access to information. Reported cases of intimidation and pressure towards independent journalists and media outlets are therefore regrettable and extremely concerning. Promoting an atmosphere of tolerance is the best way to safeguard freedom of expression and freedom of the press, and in turn, the very foundation of democracy and open society. And this is the work that we try to do uh, through our uh, projects in the, on the ground. Um, in Guatemala, um, as expressed by our spokesperson, the arrest on 29th of July of uh, uh, Jose Ruben Zamora raised uh, serious concern over press freedom, and we urged the Guatemalan authorities to guarantee his and others detained right to the due process and their, and their safety. While press freedom is guaranteed in the Constitution and freedom of expression were well established, it is deeply concerning that journalists and media outlets who investigate or criticize acts of corruption and human rights violations frequently suffer aggression as reported by, uh, by reporters without borders and by many witnesses that come to visit us regularly. So to conclude, let me highlight that the EU has the world largest fully dedicated human rights and democracy program with over 1.36 billion euros for the period 21-27, through which we underpin our work on freedom of expression and media freedom. Uh, we can also provide uh, emergency grants to human rights defenders and journalists when their lives or safety are at risk, including Mexico and, and the rest of Central America. We do it through our Protect Defender mechanism, through which only in 2021 we supported directly 550 journalists that came under threat for their work. So we continue to, to support their work of these courageous journalists who put their life on the line uh, to investigate and report on sensitive issues such as organized crime and, corrupt and corruption. So talking about the role and responsibility of the EU, which was mentioned before, we will continue our effort to flag dangerous trends in these respects in the region, including through our direct dialogue with the concerned authorities, and more open uh, advocacy work. Thank you. Muchas gracias, Ducho. Uh...
Thank you very much. We will now have time for a q and A. I am sure many people have questions here, and I am sure people online will already have questions. So if you could just raise your hand, introduce yourself, introduce your name, your organization, why, uh, who are you representing here, and then take the floor. I will moderate this q and A now. Any questions on the room? Yes, please go ahead. So we will ask three questions and then we will answer them. Hola, soy Maria Teresa Montaño. My name is Maria Teresa Montaño. I am a Mexican journalist. So just a very brief comment and then I will ask my question. I was being spied on in 2019. I was fired in 2020 because I am an investigating journalist. I work in one of the states with the highest corruption rate in Mexico. In my state, they were against transparency. I was kidnapped in 2021 as well. In 2018, strangers entered my house. They stole my recorder and they also stole my blog, my notepad. In 2021, I was kidnapped, as I said, and I was tied up for five hours. They went to my house and they stole my computers, my recorders, two cameras, and they also stole my car. I have been the object, the target of smearing campaigns. In 2018, the leader of the party of the states tried to sue me for 5 million pesos because I was reporting on something. At the time, my journal, The Universal, supported me because I had the evidence. However, afterwards, I was the target of the rest of the violence. I am a single mother and my my children have no right to scholarships. Right now, I am under protection because uh, from an organization that is that offers temporal protection to journalists at risk. All of the violent cases that I was the object of have gone unpunished. I was fired and I got no compensation because the state government required the news outlet to fire me. So I just wanted to mention all of these because it is paramount that we find a mechanism and mechanisms and policies to reinforce the protection mechanisms that exist already. In Mexico, there are state mechanisms, and at the state level, those mechanisms are completely useless. I I helped to draw legislation to protect journalists. However, when this legislation was approved many journalists were against it because they were pro government and the law enforcement forces also made sure that the legislation was not approved so we need either to expand the mechanisms or to create new policies that handle this kind of violences that are not being covered or solved by the existing mechanisms. We need to offer help to those who need work support, psychological support. For example, in my case, and I am sure other colleagues have the same situations, all of the violence I have been suffering have gone unpunished. The perpetrators have not been judged. We are lacking programs, mechanisms and different bodies that guarantee that the people who perpetrate the violence are being prosecuted.
For example, I was reporting live the irregularities in an election in 2015 and I was being targeted on Twitter. Harassment, sexual harassment is also a problem in news outlets and all of these kind of violences are not taken into account in the existing mechanisms. So we need to ensure that we put something else into place. Ah, gracias. Hola, yo soy Reina Ide Ramirez, soy reportera. Hi, I am also a reporter. I'm an independent reporter in Mexico. Can you hear me? Just by listening to my colleagues, I want to confirm what they are saying to support them. Being a journalist in Mexico and in Central America, it is extremely difficult if you are a critical journalist, if you actually investigate, sometimes you don't really have to investigate large corruption deeds with just a minimum investigation, a minimum report is sufficient for you to start being harassed daily. I want to talk specifically about provinces in Mexico because Mexico is a very big country and so the efforts are usually focused in the center and the rest of Mexico, well, journalists uh, are just uh, devoid from power and they're helpless. There are people who have left journalism, they have dropped out because they can't continue. And when I was thinking about what the Parliament or the European Union can contribute, well, Carlos was saying that he has been privileged because he has had support, uh, legal support, lawyers. Impunity in Mexico is more, it's very high. More than 90% of the assassination cases are not resolved because the authorities are, um, uh, do not have the sufficient power or the sufficient teams uh, to investigate. This does not only come from journalists. Most of the cases that uh, reach court end up in impunity. So maybe what you can contribute is something for many of us journalists to be supported, supported in our legal cases in court. Those of you who have lawyers, also can contribute to democracy. Because if you go backwards, and this seems to be the case in Latin America, it is going to be increasingly more difficult for us. Many of us have been displaced, many of us have, been, have had to leave journalism, and corrupt officials, pol corrupt politicians in, Ameri in Latin America and in Mexico in particular, in my region, where we see politicians help each other whether they are left-wing or right-wing or whatever, they help each other, they reach agreements and society loses and journalists lose because we are in between these two fires and we pay with our lives, with our health. Politicians every day try to go against critical journalists. There are, of course, all kinds of journalists. But critical journalists looking for the truth, those who try to be ethical. We uh, never, no, nobody wants to give us work. We are harassed on a daily basis. They send people to beat us. They imprison us for one, two or three days. They send the police. They fine you. They give you uh, 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 traffic um, fines even if you have been properly parked. This is the constant harassment we see in the provinces of Mexico for critical journalists. And in the end, if they cannot purchase you economically, if you cannot buy you in, then what can you do if they we are displaced, if they make us leave our communities? They send those people to attack us with weapons. I am now a beneficiary of a program, Tabla Per Magic, in Barcelona, and we thank you deeply for this, 
because the situation is difficult for those who are critical in Mexico. The current president is undergoing smearing campaigns against any critical journalists in Mexico. So if you, they're not like Peña Nieto or Calderón. Calderón was really terrible. But there is censorship and there is stigmatization and those who dare to be independent, who go against the current, the very few of those, you know, if we are now stigmatized as defending the right or defending the left, that's not fair. I know the president has not really received the criticism very nicely, but thank you for sending that criticism anyway. Thank you. Please go ahead. Thank you. Well, we have heard a number of support programs from the European Union, the European countries, the European organizations. And of course, I applaud this and I like this a lot. However, we have not heard whether there are similar programs or similar uh, support programs in the region. Does the region help the journalists in the region? Is there any institution working on this? What is the Inter-American Human Rights uh, Court doing for this? What is it, their role? What is the interest of democratic governments in the defense of journalists in the region? Do we have any information on this? Thank you. I think we can answer these questions and then if there are others, we can answer them. Probably the first one made reference to existing mechanisms, how we can reinforce them. And I would like to build on that. The European Parliament recently saw a debate on guidelines on defense and advocacy. And the European Union has stated that it should reach communities, not just advocates or famous journalists, but also those networks that are present in the territory because their work is invisibilized. Maybe Ducho or perhaps you could get involved and uh, say your point of view. And also, you have not said your name, Leopoldo. Carlos, I think he made reference to something. No sé si entendí bien la pregunta. Um, I'm not sure if I understood the question properly. The programs I mentioned are applicable to the region, no doubt. I'm not really sure whether Inter-American Court of Human Rights or the OAS has a similar program. I really don't know about this. But from our side, protect defenders and all the funds go into civil society, both for protection of individuals in case of emergency, as well as general programs to support the press, especially virtually. In, my, in many countries, this has been the only available channel, the only possibility. Well, this is for the region. Everything coming from the facility of the European Institution for Human Rights. This is also mentioned in the National Development International Cooperation Instrument. This is completely applicable for the region. And there actually are many countries I think it's about 10% of the cooperation funds. This may seem like a small percentage, but actually these programs are much less cost intensive when, con when compared to other programs. So actually these are considerable funds. Now about reaching out to communities, this is something that has been mentioned by our delegations. There is no doubt is no doubt reflected in our lack of capacity to reach to countries that are more further further away and many times we 
if I can say this, we just rem just uh, keep the elite of the of civil societies in the capital. This is something that has been mentioned to delegations. Thank you. MEP. I am go not going to tell Europe what they should not do. It would, however, be desirable that the, the European Union defend more or would speak more in defense of the principles set out in its charter and not so much in defense of its economic interests, in defense of those liberties and those human and civil rights that its charter obliged them to defend them around the world. This would be desirable. Now, with respect to inter-American organizations, a new hearing will now start at the Inter-American Human Rights Commission on the regime of exception in El Salvador. There are between 70 to 80 people this is what we believe because there, are, there is no access to information. These people have died in the past six months. Many of them have visible signs of torture. Others have been buried and their families have not been notified. Right now there is a hearing. The Commission has had several hearings to discuss the situation in El Salvador and in Central America in particular. And the rapporteur is a different thing. They have preferred silence for reasons that they know. The uh, OAS rapporteur for freedom of speech and I think they are addressing the situation as if we were living a normal period and not an extraordinary period where the freedom of the press and freedom of speech are now undergoing this danger that I have attempted to describe. There are hundreds of journalists that are exiled, dozens of journalists uh, that have been imprisoned, and an open attack of Central American regimes. And now, with respect to our democracy, our oldest democracy, the one in Costa Rica, well, right there we are now seeing a discourse against journalism as well. And the rapporteur has had a reaction that has not been very dynamic, I would say. We would like to see a rapporteur that is more convinced of its mission to defend the freedom of speech and freedom of the press. And that's all. Thank you. Thank you, Carlos. Go ahead, please. My name is Indad Bukarin. I am a correspondent for El Universal. I'd like to know the opinion of MEPs. What is your summary of the resolution in Mexico with respect to the protection of journalists and the freedom of the press in Mexico? What is your opinion on the policy Mexico has had based on this resolution? And we would like to have the opinion of the representatives of the Foreign Service uh, regarding the resolution of the Parliament. Thelma, can you please use the microphone? Good afternoon. My na name is Thelma Brenes from Nicaragua. I have two questions. One is regarding support to journalism. Journalism in Central America has had to be in exile, especially in my country, in Nicaragua, and journalists try to report from other countries for Nicaragua. This is not something temporary. It has been uh, uh, the case for three or four years, and now we are seeing our Salvadoran colleagues, and they will probably need to move as well. They will need to make journalism from the outside. The Foreign Service or the Parliament, have you thought about financing mechanisms when journalists can no longer work within their countries but they have to permanently work from abroad 
to be able to give a voice to what is happening in these uh, authoritarian regimes? That's one question. And the second one, we are supporting human rights defenders, journalists, but how are we going to support the documentation process of human rights uh, abuses? This is supporting democracy to the future, the democracy that we expect to be able to establish in 10 or 15 or 20 years. These are my two questions. Thank you, Thelma. Since we have three questions to the MEPs and the foreign service, maybe we can answer. Lily or Alicia, would you like to answer? Question, um, indeed, I think there's a very good remark. It's not only about uh, um, supporting and giving protection to the journalists, but really allowing them to be able to work abroad and, and therefore with uh, money. I was just having a quick look. There is now the proposal of the uh, European Commission on the European Media Freedom Act, and I was, there, there is also money foreseen in that context. Now, uh, to go into, and this is not... Fine. This is going to be discussed now, so it's, it's now it's a proposal from the Commission. And uh, right now there is also money that uh, support, probably not enough, but to support concrete, concretely the work as far as I understood. But I have to go through it in detail. But I find your remark very important and very interesting to, to notice. And in general, and I must say, um, I, I really appreciate um, your holistic approach of the all the distress that the journalists um, have been suffering. So we really need, um, it goes from psychological support to very concrete support to be able to do their work, uh, support of the family, of the relatives, of uh, uh, legal support also in the country. That was another thing that was mentioned in order to be able to, to react on that. And the second question you said, uh, it's more about the journalism that we want in, in, in future. So how we implement that. Uh, I, I didn't really get that because I was still listening to the translation. What was the, the precise uh, question there? But I, I think it is important to go out of the present, but also have a view for the future, how we can support um, journalism in the future that we have concrete measures on that. And I think there were interesting uh, parts that were also mentioned by the EAS, but I give the floor also to, to them for that. Yo, de pronto aquí, eh, me apoya mi experiencia anterior. I I'm based now, now on my experience the past three years in Venezuela. In some countries, self-exile can be a fact, but then in others, the problem of censorship is a problem that we see as a major problem. And this is what I meant when I mentioned the programs to support online platforms for journalists that allows them to remain in the country. We always see as a risk the, the possibility of operating from other countries. This goes hand in hand with going away from societies and in countries where the dynamic dynamics goes on, you run the risk of being isolated. And so it is always preferable to try to support those journalists who will continue doing their work there. So we should have virtual programs for this. For this. We did this in countries that are as complex as Venezuela. We also do this in Central America. And I want to mention an initiative that has been recently approved by the Alliance for Democracy and Development, the ADD, this has been promoted by Costa Rica, Dominican Republic and Panama. And there is a first project to support this initiative in freedom of expression. I have been surprised that we also have to start this work with Costa Rica to give a leadership role for these countries to defend the democratic um, processes in Central America, and also some other issues, some other problems we start to identify those countries. With respect to your 
reflection. As an MEP, I have been following the issue of Nicaragua very closely. From 2018 to the present, it has worsened. And doing uh, journalism from abroad should be very complicated. You want to protect someone who is helping you from inside, and you have to be very careful about the information that you're going to report. It is a very difficult work, not only because of how you obtain the information, but you also have to protect the person that has given you so that their life is not at risk. So I believe it is essential. There was a uh, European Media Freedom Act that was mentioned here. And with, with respect to documentation and reestablish democracy, a well documented journalist will give you good information, a good report. So documentation should not be stolen, should not be taken from you, and it should be used to better informed. This is a fundamental issue, not only to protect journalism, but also to protect democracy. These are issues we should consider and we should take note of this for the time when we uh, have an action from the parliament and we can issue an opinion so we can provide a service and we should help the people who are suffering and who are asking for this information. Thank you. Is there room for another question, another round of questions? I'm Marco Apple. I am a Mexican journalist. I work for the underground portal, International Journalism. One of the common complaints among Mexican journalists here is the speech, the discourse of the uh, Mexican president against critical journalists. So this is the, a question for the representative of the Foreign Service. Do you share these diagnoses or this complaint or this concern? Have you conveyed these in your discussions to the representatives of the Mexican government? And maybe you can answer the question uh, that my colleague asked about uh, also what the MEP think about this uh, policy of the federal government against journalists. These issues have been mentioned in the dialogue I mentioned in July new, in the New Mexico Human Rights Dialogue. They are always I mean, I have joined recently, this is what I heard from my colleagues, but the part of the dialogue on human rights is one of the components where you can see the glass half filled. It is one of the components where the partnership works better and you can actually convey these messages as opposed to other countries where these uh, dialogue bridges have been broken. This is something we are doing. We are starting to prepare the interlocutory dialogue, the trialogue actually, this is how we call it, a meeting with the civil society and authorities for the next dialogue in March. And so we believe this can be a possibility to put these issues on the table. <laughs> Regarding the resolution, this is what I was mentioning here with Tilly. We belong to the delegation of relations between Europe and Latin America, but I am really focused in Central America. Tilly is the president of the commission. I represent my political group there. I can't tell you 
what the response of the Mexican president was to the resolution issued by the parliament, because I haven't really closely followed uh, the Mexican press to see how they have uh, considered this resolution and what their reaction has been in the country. I don't want to answer with no knowledge and I don't want to give a, uh, a contrary, um, a wrong answer. Thank you, Alicia. Yes, I can answer about this because 15 days after the resolution was passed and 15 days after uh, the fact that President AMLO did not consider the resolution, another journalist was murdered. The number of uh, murdered journalists increased. The resolution did not say that the Mexican government was killing them. The resolution was actually saying very clearly that there is an impunity on the killings and the persecutions of journalists. The reaction of President López Obrador was to dismiss this and to insult us. He insulted all the European MEPs, including me. He told me a Washington uh, dog. I know it's a lie, and that's why, and I, uh, I, I, you know, I don't obey to Washington. I haven't been to Washington in years. Maybe he has some issues to solve with Washington. And as I clearly told a Mexican journalist, you know, when when you fight with a dog that has rabbis, you go, you have to fight with the dog. The Parliament unanimously, almost unanimously, condemned the government of López Obrador because he of the impunity on this issue, and he continues to dismiss. Unfortunately, there is no effect between the commercial relationships and respect of human rights. That's a completely different thing, unfortunately. Can I answer? Leopoldo is an MEP in this chamber. He belongs to the IPP group. And he will travel to Honduras soon. I have a last question and I would like to answer Marco and to build upon what Ducho said. I participated representing the high level dialogue and the Mexican party asked the Mexican government for a constructive dialogue and for following up the petitions. At the beginning of next year, there will be a follow up to the high level dialogue and the Mexican colleagues will be there fighting. We will continue fighting we will be on the European side and the Mexican colleagues will be on the Mexican side to demand the Mexican government to respond before the Mexican civil society. I will give the last word to Yiria and then Alicia, you will have to wrap up. I'm Iria. I work in international protection and I want to refer to the mechanisms. We will have the European hearing and the next visit. We as an organization are working on analyzing and comparatively studying protection mechanisms, national and mechanisms and uh, comprehensive policies to defend people and journalists. The first policy was recorded 25 years ago in Colombia in the midst of the war. And so these policies are created based on the responsibility of the states, not on, based on the responsibilities of NGOs. And uh, of course, we need to protect human rights. I would like to ask the MEPs, because you're going to do this trip, please do insist before governments, any government that uh, considers itself democratic, such as in Guatemala, where they have stopped the process since 2017, 
the official version is we don't even know where the draft is. We are working with Mexico. We need more investment in this. That we need more comparative analysis. We need the universities, academia, ministries. We need a lot more investment. The emergency relocation saves lives. We all know that. When you need to leave the country, you do. But responsibility is the only way to construct this from the states. Thank you, Iria. Lucia, very briefly. Thank you. This is important. Women journalists should not be disappeared. They need to have a priority in the dialogue with the Mexican government. There is a double stigmatization here. You know, you're stigmatized not only because you are a critical journalist, but also because you are a woman in a country where 10 women are killed every day. Showing, visibilizing what happens with uh, women journalists is critical. 15 years ago, when we started the documentation of uh, violence against women, there was scorn with what was happening. We do have the documentation of what is going on and the impact it has. And we simply want to request that all those actions from the parliament should look also at this double discrimination we, the women, are experiencing as a proactive exercise towards equality, democracy and the rule of law. Thank you. Thank you, Lucia. And with this intervention, now we give the floor to Alicia. I think it's not easy to wrap up all these issues mentioned here. Some situations are very intense and tough. Just to listen to them. I can't even imagine what it is like to live them. So let me begin by thanking all of you for this event for putting on the table these uh, themes that are very important and that are relevant for the European Union as well. This legislature has insisted that Latin America is a strategic region for us. Josep Borrell, the high representative of the Union, has repeatedly said that we need to take Latin America much more seriously and even more so with the war of Putin against Ukraine which has uh, made a new geopolitical order evident. The European Union needs more uh, reliable partners with whom it will have more issues in common, and it probably will find this in Latin America. We will find reliable actors in civil society, also in some governments that may be interesting, and we need to have uh, links in common, bonds in common. There's a lot bringing us together. We want to relaunch this relationship with Latin America, and that is why we need to be interested in the problems that the different countries may have, what they can offer us so that we can help them, not to tell them what they need to do. They will ask for help in a certain issue, and we may be able to provide that help and pro probably give them our experience in other aspects, but basically we will give them our help. And also, we need to learn what these countries have been doing. Why is it that they are better than us? I think the learning is mutual. Well, there are many things, and I think we should never have this moral superiority that Europe is usually accused of, and many times they are right. These accusations are right. So we probably need to change that view they have of us. We have dealt here with the situation of journalists in risk, both in Mexico as well as in Central America. We should be interested in this and we should continue to debate this at the European level. Many countries in Latin America may be a reliable partner. They may, may be more reliable than in other countries in the world, and this is because we share several values, and the democratic routing is higher than in other continents, or at least this is the will to be democratic. 
threats and violence against journalists are a problem for these democracies as we have as you have discussed before a free and plural journalism i think is critical for the health the democratic health of a country uh, citizens need to have right to this information then they need to have their own judgment based on what is being reported so we need to consider their work in checking, controlling the institutions in such uh, uh, complicated political systems. Good journalism empowers the citizens, so the citizens can make their own decisions. And bad journalism, or journalism intervened by interests that is not rigorous, that is not plural, well, I think what they do is they weaken the citizens and they weaken democracy in the end. In the past few years in Europe we have been able to check how the erosion of journalism can impact uh, the health, the democratic health of a country and the propagation of fake news is one of the main issues in societies nowadays because they threaten coexistence by polarizing societies and this is the tool the weapon used in Europe and in other countries used by ex the extreme right to be in power and we should fight all of this together and I think probably all of us will agree that these situations should not happen. And we need to strengthen good journalism as much as we can. And we need to protect good journalism because this is what is going to help us safeguard democracies. We Europeans today can understand the situation of journalism that you have expressed here today and also the situation of democracies as you were saying i think the bond is essential of course fake news are not the same as you were saying it is clear that one thing is not related to the other but the threat is very similar it's democracy that is at risk. Each, in each of the countries that we have heard here, each of the risks that uh, the journalists are facing, they may seem different because of the type of threat, because it may come from different stakeholders in the country. It could be gangs, it could be corrupt politicians, it could be drug traffickers or uh, laws passed by governments that are going to more authoritarian regimes, among other examples. And so all of these threats, what they have in common is that journalism very clearly uh, is an obstacle for the authoritarians. A person that is an obstacle is a person that should not be there. And also those who do not listen to criticisms, whether it is a, uh, a Bukele or Ortega who have become dictators, or a corrupt police officer, or a businessman who does not want social protests uh, as a result of his projects or the existence of a cartel. There may be, may be different players affecting the journalistic project. This is a powerful minority that attempts to silence journalists because most of them, in the end, want a strong democracy that will allow us to have all the information objectively to create their own perspectives. I think there is a democratic majority that does want free press and these Minorities are sometimes very powerful and unfortunately they do not contribute to solve this. Since I have been an MEP, I have seen that these networks 
pro-human rights networks are essential. You need to join your voices, join your forces to make the message be spread out and see how we can help you. In the end, you are the one who needs to show us the agenda and say, this is happening in our country, what can you do to help us? And I think you will always find us here to debate and to find some support that we will be delighted to provide. So thank you very much for this day. It has been very interesting, very productive, very enriching, and I hope that we can be in touch to analyze the situation of the different countries that you have mentioned. Thank you. No se vayan porque ahora hay, como bien indica la agenda, una recepción con unas bebidas para que podamos conversar también un poco más. Now you will have a drink and some food outside so we can keep the debate going on.